resonance, engineering academy of science, Suri Vidya Mukundar, this invitation. I want to tell you a little bit about a, a, a word called entropy and where it enters in many different parts of science. I will tell you a little bit about what the word means, what people have thought about it, and different contexts in which it arises. So let me start with two quotations. First quotation is one from the very well known astrophysicist Eddington who said that the law that entropy always increases holds, I think, the supreme position among the laws of nature. He was a very well-known astrophysicist, a thinker at that time. He was, one of the, he, he was reputed to be one of the few people who understood Einstein's theory of gravity at the time that Einstein proposed it initially. That's what he says. So it's obviously, this is something important to understand. Because someone is eminent as Eddington says. So, there's a second quotation. This is from another very famous mathematician and physicist, von Neumann. He said, whoever uses the term entropy in a discussion always wins, since no one knows what entropy really is. So in a debate, one always has the advantage. So that's interesting. So someone said entropy is the most important idea in physics and physical laws and everything. And someone said that, look, you'll always win an argument if you talk about entropy because no one understands. So what we want to do is to try and explain a little bit about what entropy is so that Hopefully, we will come to a little better understanding, we'll be a little better off than this quotation here, and in a little better position to understand why the first quote is important, why it assigns such importance to the idea of entropy. Let's just start with movies. So, that will show you movie one and movie two next to each other. And you can see these two things collide with each other, these two sort of balls on the track. On the first movie. These movies look somewhat different. But there is a difference. The same movie that's run backward. Okay, so you take it, imagine putting it back into whatever it is that you're using to play it, and it plays it backwards. So it's as though one movie is forward in time, and the other movie is going backwards in time. Movie one and movie two. How many people think that movie one is a movie that goes forward in time? Okay, so a slightly larger number of you think that movie 2 is the one that is run forward in time as opposed to 1. Let me show you a second movie after this. Again, movie 1 and movie 2. Okay. How many of you think movie 1 is the one that goes forward in time? Raise your hands. How many of you think movie 2 is the one that goes forward in time? Raise your hands. Ah, okay, so almost all of you agree. And in that sense, that is the correct answer. In fact, you were also right about the first one, that it is movie two that is the one that goes forward. But it's much harder to tell in the top row than in the bottom row. I can understand that half of you were conflicted about this, and some of you thought it was one, some of you thought it was two. Okay. So now the question is, <coughs> if you started with atoms that sort of collided with each other and moved apart, the laws of physics don't really tell you about the difference between time going forward and time going backward. And this is a sort of idealization of that. The fact that two things collide and come and separate out. Whether you see them collide and go through and bang off like this, or whether the exact reverse process happens, is something that the laws of physics, or the laws of mechanics, according to Newton, don't tell you about. On the other hand, you can, in practical terms, all of you demonstrated, very easily tell the difference in some situations where you run a movie forward and you run a movie backward. Okay? So in some situations it's possible for you to tell the direction of time. And in some situations, even physics guarantees that you should not be able to tell whether a movie is being played forward in time or it's being played backward in time. So now the question is, and this is like a question that, that Ram Ram Swami asked yesterday. Why is it that time seems to go forward only in one direction? Where does that particular aspect come from in our own experience? When the laws of physics don't prescribe that time should move forward versus backwards. The other way of saying this in a slightly more formal and technical way, why do physical processes, and you can, sub you can substitute for physical processes, you can substitute anything, because finally physics governs everything in our lives. It's all the motion of atoms that interact with each other. It governs you, me, biology, everything. Of course, there are many levels of organization that sit above that. And most of the time, it's not particularly useful to think about atoms doing things. We shouldn't remember that the substrate of everything that happens in the world is things, atoms that interact with each other, forming molecules, forming more molecules, and even forming sort of the glory that is like at a scale that is much larger than that. 
So now you can ask, why do physical forces happen? Spontaneously in one direction and not in another. Why is it that you never see the egg reconstitute miraculously from the completely spread out configuration there, as in the first movie? But you're always guaranteed to see the second movie. This relates to the question of what is the fate of our universe? As you go forward in time, what is the final state that all of us are going to find out? What happens to the Earth, the solar system, and the galaxy? What is this end to which everything is actually moving? The word that people use for this is the arrow of time. The time moves in one direction, and that direction is singled out by something. So where does the arrow of time actually come from? That's another way of progressively increasing the scope of the questions that I ask in the beginning. The rough answer, and we're going to start with this answer to try and motivate everything that we can talk about later, is that time moves roughly so that you have more ordered situations giving rise to less ordered situations. And that is the natural direction of time. So the more ordered egg that breaks up into this huge mess on the left hand side, that's more natural for it to happen because you have a more ordered situation that becomes a less ordered situation. Although it's completely possible by the laws of physics for the less ordered situation to come miraculously reconstituted into the egg, that doesn't happen. And it's the difference between more order becoming less order that sets the natural direction of the arrow of time. So the Humpty Dumpty story that some of you may remember is exactly an example of that. It's easy, you know, he had a big fall and all the things horses and men couldn't put them together again. That's exactly the same principle. That once you break the egg, it's very hard to put the egg back together. So there's another way of saying this, which again brings in the idea of entropy. And that's to say that there is some quantity called the entropy, such that processes that happen spontaneously on their own. For example, the breaking of the egg versus the unbreaking of the egg, the backward step, are those that increase the entropy. That's a slightly different language. We've said that it goes to that life and everything, the arrow of time moves from more order to less order. So entropy is a way of quantifying that in a sense, of saying more order means less entropy, more disorder means more entropy, and life and its processes and the arrow of time move you from more order to less order or more disorder. So that's one way of colloquially talking about the idea. So on the left hand side, entropy decreases because you have the egg that's broken, it spontaneously reconstitutes itself. On the right hand side, moving on the right hand side, entropy increases because you go from an ordered situation to a more disordered situation. And it's the right hand movie that, as all of you said, is the right thing. That really is the direction. And for us, the language that people use is that's the direction in which entropy increases. That's a picture of low entropy now to high entropy, and that sort of little arrow there is the arrow of time. And that's what sets the direction of time in this way of thinking about it. So let's ask this question. Where does this come from? Can we understand why nature prefers the high entropy disordered states? So that it inexorably wants to move it towards the states from an initial order situation. So the nice example for this comes from a Dutch physicist called Ehrenfest. They are complicated by physicists to read about them. And this is an example of Ehrenfest dogs and scientists. I'll tell you what the dogs and scientists are. Ehrenfest thought of two dogs. Both of them are shown there, both of them smiling faces. And he thought of a flea. Many of you are zoologists, this is not what a flea actually looks like. I know that too. This is my representation of a flea. That's part of the exercise. Erwin says that, that, look, I can have a flea, flea is like dogs, if any of you have kept dogs in home. So the flea can hop from one dog to the other. So that's the flea hopping from dog number one on the left hand side to dog number two on the right hand side. The fleas don't care which dog they're on. So if they were on dog one, they are perfectly happy to move to dog two. If they're on dog two, they're perfectly happy to move to dog one. Okay. So we clear on this? Many fleas. So now I have lots of fleas on these. These are very dirty dogs. They have lots of fleas. The fleas don't care which dog they're on. They can move from one dog to the other. And that's exactly what they do. You have many fleas. Each flea decides on their own or independently to jump out of the dog that they're on to another dog. Okay? Good. Let's suppose, let's start with, for explanation, let's suppose there are a hundred and we're going to label them one to hundred. We put a little mark on them that tells you what number they are. So the rule is going to be, choose a number between one and hundred. 
Okay. Make the flea with that particular number. All your fleas are now numbered. Make the flea with that number, or for whichever dog it happens to be on, it's the other dog. That's, that's the only one. So choose a number at random. It could be 97, 3, 47, 94, 72, etc. etc. And just make the flea on. Okay? That's a simple enough rule. We want to start with a special state. And that's the state when 99 flea are on dog number 1. And there is one flea on dog number 2. Now we're going to do this thing. So, give me a number, one of you. 65. So, dog number 65. 65 is most likely to be on dog number 1 because most of the three are anyway on dog number It's very unlikely that that number that you picked, which is 65, is on dog number 2. So, we'll imagine that a flea with the number 65 has moved from dog number 1 to dog number 2. Pick another number, do that again, pick a number, do that again. So, in the beginning, yeah, 14, we can also do 14. In the beginning was that fit line on the top, where you had 99 fleas on one dog and one flea on the second dog. But after a long time, you can guess, <laughs> and you can also write little computer simulation to do that, that there are roughly equal numbers of fleas on both sides. So that's a picture, a little graph of what it is. The blue is, the blue line there is the dog on the left. So it's, most, and so it's time on this axis. So time, at time t equal to zero, most of the fleas are on the first dog, the 99 fleas. And there's one flea on the second dog, so it starts at one day. As you keep exchanging flea, follow number, jump a flea, follow number, jump a flea, etc. At some point, pretty much they get mixed up. And at that point, there's roughly speaking, there are small fluctuations about that. There are about 50 on one dog, and there are about 50 on another dog. This is important because the fact that which time fleas are distributed more evenly comes even though the fleas don't care which dog they're on. The flea was perfectly happy being on the dog that had 99 fleas as opposed to the dog that had one flea. So the dynamics of the flea, the hoppings of the flea, don't care. They're really unconcerned about nothing about arrow of time. You call their number, they jump. You call this number, it jumps here, etc. Et Yet the state that you wind up with is very different from the state that you start about. Okay. And started out state was somewhat special because I had most of the of the fleas and one dog in a flea. You could say it's more ordered in a sense. If I ask where is any particular flea likely to be flea number 65, for example, much more likely to be on, on dog number one than on dog number two. So that had a certain order that the data state didn't have. Because now after many times of hopping back and forth, I really don't know where that so number 65 went. It could be on either dog number two. So the fact that I started with a more initial, more symmetric initial, a more special initial state, an asymmetric one, where most of the fleas were on one dog, but I wound up with this much more disordered, much more symmetrical state, where there are roughly equal number of fleas on both, even though my rules did not specify that I should reach that number. This, in a sense, is a demonstration of how entropy works. How you can go, even with rules, they don't care about how time is being distributed, from more asymmetrical, more ordered situation to more symmetrical situation. So as I said, the nice word to use here is entropy. That these final states, and it's not just one state with exactly 50, 50 here, maybe it's 51 and 49 here, maybe it's 52 and 48 here. It keeps fluctuating as these two back and forth. But these final states have more entropy, they're more disordered than the special initial state. Because if I gave you the number, the number of the state, it could either be on dog one or on dog two. So if I asked about the probability that randomly chosen flea is on dog A or dog B, in this initial state, this very unusual special state, with probability 99 out of 100 is on dog 1, probability 1 out of 100 is on dog 2. Whereas, once I go on and on in time, much later time, okay, so roughly 50 out of 100 here, roughly 50 out of 100 here. Let's introduce one new useful word. And that's the idea of a macro state. A macro state is just saying, what is the fraction of fleas on a dog? Okay. So in the first case there, 99% is 1%. Is 1 here. In the second case, it's 50% and 50%. Here. I haven't told you which fleas. I just said, this is the number of fleas here, the number of fleas here, the fraction in both cases. As time goes on, I have less and less information about where a particular flea might be. 
separate from a macro state. So this is my word for a macro state. This is just a fraction of fleas on dog one and dog two. I can also talk about the micro state. That is, which flea is on which dog. So the micro state here is that dog one has fleas one, four, seven, twelve, etc., 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 and dog two has fleas two, three, five, six, eight, nine, ten. It's a much more detailed and very specific way of saying which fleas on which dog. I've lost all that information when I go to the macro state. But it's sitting there because I know I have numbered all my fleas. So all I need is to go and look at the dog and find out what were the fleas on that particular dog. So in this first case, there are relatively few microstates that correspond to this particular microstate on the left. And in fact, you know how to calculate it because you just have to change the number of the flea that's on the other one. Everybody else has to be on dog one. So I can put dog flea number one on, on the second dog, flea number two on the second dog, flea number three on the second dog, etc. There are a hundred choices. 100 ways of doing that. On the right hand side, it's a little more complicated. Right? So even if I say exactly 50 here, exactly 50 here, how many ways do I have to choose 50 free to put on dog one? Because then all the rest I can put on dog two without a problem. So this, you should know the answer. I will not ask you, but if you think about it for a few minutes, you can figure out that answer. But that answer is much larger than 100. So there are many, many, many more microstates in the second case than there are in the first case. Okay. So here's entropy again. What entropy does is measure the number of microstates in the system that are consistent with that macrostate. If I tell you my macrostate is, it's a little more conveniently defined using a log for various technical reasons that we won't get into. But here is the actual expression. And this is the person who wrote down this expression for the first time. This is a person called Ludwig Boltzmann, very eminent physicist, who on his gravestone in, in the end, this k log omega is inscribed. So it's actually important enough to be part of it. You can say, by the glory of God, I happen to be here. This is equal to k log omega. Okay. So there are some terms in here. S is the entropy. S is the, the letter that is normally used to associate with the entropy. K is a constant. We won't worry about it. It's called a Boltzmann constant. And omega is precisely the number of microstates that correspond to a given microstate. But there's all of the information that you might need. It. You may see this later in your life in various contexts, but it's good to sort of show you the importance of this formula and how simple it actually is. It tells you what an entropy is. So now we can say why does entropy increase? Why do things become more disordered? And the reason is it's simply because there are so many, many more microstates associated with a single microstate in which the number of fleas on each dog is approximately the same, as opposed to the case where they're very different. There's just so many more states that you can go to that you tend to lose memory of that very special state in which you started out with. There's also an interesting relationship between entropy and inflammation. And that's we'll talk a little bit about this later. Higher entropy means more disorder, but it also means more inflammation if you actually make a measurement. If I tell you which dog a certain flea. So let's say flea number 33. If I say flea number 33 is, dog, is on dog 2, I have given you a lot more information than I have in the more disordered case than I would have in the initial case. Because there, pretty much any flea will be on dog 1 because it's such an asymmetric case. So it's funny that this relationship between entropy and information is also encoded into how we think about states and how we define them. Right? Even though you might think that entropy means it's disordered, it's all a mess, I don't know what's going on. In a more disordered situation, any bit of information that I get about the system adds to my knowledge compared to what I had in the more disordered case, in the more ordered case. So another way of saying this is information is resolved uncertainty. That at the more uncertainty I have, every bit of information is important to me in resolving that uncertainty. And this is the relationship between information and entropy in a somewhat more abstract sense. What about going back? Suppose I have now mixed up the fleas. Now the fleas are on both dogs, roughly 50%, 50%. How do I get back to that initial situation? There are two answers to this. One is that if each dog doesn't, if each flea doesn't care, it's moving backward. Sooner or later, finally, after the you know the universe has ended and several billions, billions and billions and billions of years, it's likely that I will move back to this completely asymmetric solution very briefly. It won't last because things, because the moment everything winds up here, there's something to take it out. But it's possible, given these rules, to go back. It's just very, very, very unlikely. That's one answer. The second answer is, yes, 
But you need to have more information to do that. But you need to have a sort of ledger that says, okay, here are the fees on dog one, here are the fees on dog two. Call out a number for me. Do I check is it dog one on dog two? If it's on dog two, then I move it to dog one. So I need more information about the system. I need to do more work in order to do this. I didn't have to do this earlier. My old rule was completely done. It didn't care which fee that or which dog the fee was on. I just moved it from there, moved it from there. If I want to move back, if I want to create order out of this order, I need to do work. At least in the sense of maintaining a register of which fees happen to be square and only moving those fees from the dog, let's say dog two, to dog one if I wanted to wind up in this initial very easily. Okay. But I said this information, getting this additional information comes with the cost. We could go back, but only we'd have to know the number of each fleet on dog number B in order to move to dog number. So that's a sort of graph of what we've done so far. We said going from less entropy to more entropy, many fleets on one dog to roughly equal fleets on both dogs, is easy. That's spontaneous. That automatically happens. To move back. A more entropy to less entropy is not spontaneous. I either have to wait a very, very long time for it to happen, much more than I actually care to wait, or I have to put in some amount to work or any to get more information about the system in order to move back. So it's easy to go forward in time, increasing an in entropy, but it's hard to move backward and reduce entropy to a system that already has a high entropy. So this is the second part of the talk, and it's a little more about physics and how we think about entropy conventionally. And that has to do with thinking about the arrow of time in terms of heat and how it flows. Okay. All of you are familiar with his anecdotally or in your experience with what heat is. But how do you think about heat and what is the importance of, of, of heat in our lives? Well, heat is a way of transferring energy to a system. For example, you turn on the gas burner, you put a bottle, you put a metal uh, container of water and then the water will boil. What you have done is use the energy that comes from burning the natural gas that comes out of the cylinder into increasing the energy of the molecules inside the water. This is very different from other ways of adding energy to the system. So that's the aspect of the the sky is falling from the head. And then it's sort of you've taken something, lifted it up, all of the molecules are sort of bodily shift and then you're dropping it on something. You've increased the mechanical energy of the system by lifting it up. And by dropping it down, you're increasing it, you're, you're converting that potential energy into the energy required to fall on that. You drop it and you can manage to do work. But adding heat, for example, converting, heating up something and converting water into steam within a steam machine, is another way of adding energy to something. Okay. But it's very different. So these are two ways of adding energy, of transferring energy to a body. But adding heat is subtly different from doing something mechanical. And that's an important point to be discussed. The subtle difference is this, and it's actually not very subtle, it's part of your experience. That heat always flows from a hot object to a cold. It doesn't matter what those objects are. If something is hotter and something is colder, you put them in contact. Heat will always flow from the hot object to the cold object. And there's another example of something that's very asymmetric. Who said that heat had to flow from hot to cold? Why didn't heat flow from cold to hot? I have a cup of coffee, I put it on the table, and after some time it cools down. I don't want my cold cup. So why don't I expect the laws of nature to give me automatically hot cup, snap my fingers and suddenly go up and what's preventing that? Why is it that in our experience, heat always flows from hot to cold and never comes to hot? So I said I promised I would tell you what is heat and how to think about heat. Heat is just heat. Is something that is a threat that can be added to a body, you add heat to a body and increase its temperature. And temperature just measures the random jiggling about of the molecule itself. Adding heat increases this randomness. All of you, the gas in this room, the air in the room that we breathe, all of this is constant to molecules that are constantly moving. All of us at any given time are constantly moving ourselves. All our molecules are jiggling around, wiggling there, jiggling there. So it's a fundamental property of anything. That's not at the absolute zero of temperature. Okay. So, heating something up really means this. It increases the average energy of the atoms and molecules inside because it just makes them move faster. This random motion of it is just increased in speed on average. Okay. So, adding heat 
increases the random motion of atoms and molecules. You don't observe this directly, you only observe it indirectly. But then you could ask the question, let me just suck out the energy inside that random motion that's trying to keep there and do something with it. For example, let me suck out the random energy of the molecules inside this room and use it to heat up my cup of coffee that I have in front of it. See, perfectly reasonable for me to do that. This will be one way of taking something at a low temperature and for sucking it up into something and increasing the temperature of that object, which doesn't happen because heat only flows from hot to cold. But why doesn't that happen? And why shouldn't it happen? So the answer is, well, we could do that, but it, as with everything in nature, it doesn't come for free. As we go back, we go back to more order situations, we have to supply, do additional work, get additional information about the system in order to make that step back. So you can interpret the transfer of heat in another way, that adding heat increases the entropy of time. Okay. In natural spontaneous processes, the entropy can only increase, and the direction of heat flow is set by this, that it flows from cool to hot, because that corresponds to entropy overall, actually. The interesting thing is that when you ask where did the idea of entropy actually come from, it came from the desire to make a better steam engine. This is, we are now talking about 250 years or in the past. And there, what people wanted to do, so this is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. There were big changes in the way industrial processing actually happened over large scale. The discovery that you could, you could take coal and heat it up and run large scale industrial processes was just launched upon the scene. And all of this relies on some very simple facts about gases. When you heat a gas, it expands. So when you cool a gas, it contracts. And the expanding gas can be used to do work. In the example there, on the right hand side, all of you is again the pressure cooker here. You take a pressure cooker, you put it on the stove, you heat it up, and then this little thing at the top, the little object, it moves, and then it falls back. That's because the pressure has built up sufficiently inside. At some point, it becomes enough to push that little object up. That, that normally caps it, it releases the pressure and then the gas falls back. Okay. So you could imagine using the force, it did need a certain amount of force to push that little cap on top. You can imagine harnessing that and doing other useful things. That's exactly what a steam engine is. Okay. That's a nice picture of an old steam engine, it's a much more cleaner steam engine than the one that you might be used. In fact, I'm not sure people use steam engines anymore. Even so here's a movie that gives you sort of one example of what a steam engine actually does. Here, here's a sort of proto version, the version that came before the actual steam engine. There's no sound to this, so I will supply my own sound to this particular movie. You can see that the energy is released by burning coal at the bottom there. There is a vapor that is formed, just so that liquid there, there's vapor that forms, and that vapor, just like your pressure cooker goes, opens it to stop off and pushes it. As it expands, it pushes this thing up. And there is a chain. So this whole thing is, is sort of moving up and down. Because it's expanded, it pushed it up, but then you have to cool it back down again. So you add cold water to that, that makes it come down again. Then you can see what it does. So this is a plot of the pressure inside that cylinder as a function of the volume. And you can see that as it goes up and down, it's a cyclical. It comes back to its original point. It starts here, goes here, comes down, comes down, comes back up. So that's an important point. If you want to make something useful, you have to make it work in itself. So this is how you take something that functions in this particular manner and actually make it a steam engine. So that's how the engine actually works. It's the same thing, it's a somewhat more complicated arrangement out there of using, but it's still the steam that tends to expand, it has to come back, expand, come back, expand, come back. And that's what drives the whole engine as it moves forward. So that's what happens inside a steam engine. There is water that's being heated into steam. The combustion comes from the coal. It drives the piston. The piston turns the crankshaft, and then the steam engine moves forward. And you can adjust. You can adjust by by putting less coal or putting more coal. You can adjust the rate at which this actually turns. And there's a nice picture of this. Again, it's a nice movie. This is completely made out of glass. This is exactly what a little steam engine does, and it's. Just by that little bit of fuel over there, this person is lighting up with a match. So we can watch this. There's a small fuel fuel tablet. There's water inside that container there. And now you can see it slowly begin to heat up. 
thing that you perceive that. So now it's boiling, and that's how the steam engine actually works. The nice thing about this is it's completely made out of glass. There are no joints where you have to stick them. That's the sort of tabletop steam engine. So this is a gentleman called Sadi Karno, the French physicist and engineer, who wanted to design good steam engines. The reason he wanted to design good steam engines was because he said the French were very competitive with the English at that time. The English had, of course, a great uh, advantage in designing steam engines. So the French wanted to sort of do better than them. So the natural question was, how do I make a more efficient steam engine? What do I need to do? So Carlo thought about this in a very simple way. He said that, let me go back to that simple idealization that I had about the steam engine and try and extract from that just the important information that I need to analyze what makes it an engine efficient. So he said, whenever there's a difference in temperature, I can get some work and some power out of it. And all of this power really comes because I'm able to take heat from something that's hot, transfer it to something that's cold, and in the way in between, get some work that you've done out of it. So that's the sort of logic behind the steam engine that you saw a little earlier. And Kano realized exactly as you did that you have to do this in a cycle. You have to go back to the initial state because you keep having to go back to the start that you started out with. So you have to repeat this process, taking heat from something, doing work on it, and then releasing some of that heat to the outside. Okay. Kano also realized that inevitably when you make something that has moving parts, there is friction that is involved. And friction is a way of getting rid of heat. But it's not use, you're not doing work with it. The heat that you get rid that you get rid of isn't really useful for anything in practice. So he said, I'm going to make the best possible engine that I can think of with my mind. That engine is something that I can ideally reverse. I can both move forward and I can actually move back. That's a, that's a way of making the most efficient, the best engine that you could possibly do. So then the question was, I have a hot reservoir, my coal that I'm adding. I have a cold reservoir, the water that I'm pushing in from outside. How do I make something efficient with operating the steam engine? You could imagine doing what I've shown you on the right hand side. Take a hot reservoir of heat, take energy from that, make all of that into work. Why bother with the cold reservoir at all? So that's encoded in something which is one way of writing the second law of thermodynamics, which is the important law that defines <coughs> entropy. It says it's impossible to make a cyclic device that only does this, that only takes heat from here and converts all of it into work without doing anything else. The reason is that it's because of how heat works. I have added entropy when I transfer heat, that's what we understood. But now my system has lots of entropy in it and I can't get rid of all of that by doing work because I can't take all the entropy in heat that I've added and convert that into the work that I want to get out of it. I must be able to suck some of that out, which is why I need a cold reservoir in addition to that. So let me quickly go over this very idealized <coughs> engine that Kano made. Kano said, okay, I have a hot reservoir and a cold reservoir. One is 100 degrees, one is 2 degrees over here. And I have a movable piston. The movable piston is what actually helps me to do work. First step, connect the hot reservoir to the movable piston. If the gas, I'm lighting it up here. It will expand. It will push the piston. Once it goes up, I'm going to switch off the contact with the hot reservoir. It will continue to expand, okay? But now it will also begin to cool down because it's doing work, energy is being sucked out of it. It's now cooling down, although there's no energy flowing in or out of it. It's cooling down on its own. The third step is to connect it to the cold reservoir. And the cold reservoir, I can suck out now the remaining amounts of heat that I need to get it back to its initial state. Last step, don't let it have any reservoir at all. Let it keep on contracting until it finally reaches the state at which it started. So now that's your full cycle. You've got some work out of it and you let it come back to the initial state. Because this was the simplest engine, the most idealized thought experiment that you could think of, Anu could calculate exactly how much work was required in this and how much how efficient, how much energy you took in, how much energy you gave out how much work you have to do with the difference in that energy. And then he figured out very crucially that all, all of that heat could actually be used to do work. 
because you have to be able to suck out the entropy from the system to manipulate it back. So that's so the graph here is just the four steps that Carno had outlined. You start at step one, you put in the heat, then you take the heat away, you go from two to two, two to three where you cool down, then you go from three to four where you suck the heat out, so that you connect it to the to the low temperature reservoir, and then you finally go from four to one again, then you go up and you compress the gas. So there you have your cycle. You know how much entropy came in, you know how much entropy went out, you know it's perfectly uh, perfectly reversible. From here you can calculate the entropy. We won't go into that, but I will just tell you that the relationship that Carnot defined find is what we use now. That's the relationship between the change in entropy and the change in heat energy that you supply. The entropy change is ds, the heat energy change is dq, and t is the temperature. So if I write it in another way, the change in, in heat, the heat energy that supply, which is the dq, goes into changing the entropy, which is ds, and the factor that sticks outside is the temperature. So now we've talked about entropy in multiple different ways. We started out saying it's going to be more ordered to less ordered, that is entropy. Entropy corresponds to saying things are more ordered, more disordered. And we'd have a log of omega, which is a log of the number of microstates. But it's a completely different way of thinking about it. This says that I can increase the entropy by passing heat. The system I think about it as a gas. This is what fundamentally determines how efficient an energy that is going to be in my ability to do work. It doesn't look as though these two things are the same, but they are actually the same. And that's the real miracle of this whole enterprise. Let me sort of finish up by just a few last statements about what entropy is. And go back to this question of the more possibilities there are, the higher the entropy. There are more possibilities for a flea, a particular number of flea on dot one or dot two, in the second case, as opposed to the first case. What Boltzmann did when writing this equation was say that Entropy measures how many macro states, micro states there are that are consistent with a macro state, the large scale description of the system. And that is this expression, S equal to K log omega, where omega is the number of micro states that are available at a particular condition. All of this translates into a completely different field. And that's the field of information and communication. And the big name out here is a person called Shannon, Claude Shannon who was an American communications engineer who worked in Dell Labs in the 1930s and the 1940s. So this goes back to the fact that the more disordered the situation is, the more information that I can get out of it from a specific machine. The other way of saying it is that the use value of something that you communicate depends upon the degree to which the content of the message is surprising. If you communicate that, look, Bangalore is around 15 degrees this morning. It's okay, that seems to be correct for January. Bangalore is about minus 5 degrees this morning. Very unusual. That's information that I didn't have. It's not okay. If an event is very probable, it's no surprise when it actually happens. If an event is unlikely to occur, it's much more informative to learn that that event actually happened or will happen. So here's the third context in which entropy appears. It measures the average amount of surprise that you get when you receive information. So the amount of information that you convey for identifying the outcome of an event, which happens with some property. The more the surprise, the larger the entry. Quick set of equations. There is a head and a tail. And remember Ram Ram Sami's talk yesterday where you talked about you toss a coin up there. Property who said it was property half of falling heads and half of becoming tail. And he also told you about the student who came up to him and tossed a coin 20 times and every, every one of the 20 times it came out. So it depends upon how you, the mechanics of tossing that particular coin. Here's an expression for the entropy, which looks like this. So you can get the log in here, but it appears in a particular way. So S is minus probability of heads, log the property of heads, minus property of tails, log the property of tails. If heads and tails are equally likely, both have property one half. This is minus one half log one half, minus one half log one half, which is minus log one by two, which is log of zero. On the other hand, if the student who threw up 20 heads and 20 coins and they all came up heads, then the property of heads is one, property of tails is zero. And this expression for the entropy gives you zero. Okay. This expression for entropy is due to Shannon. This 
can generalize to minus sum over i probability of event i log probability of event i. This generalizes the formula, the simple formula, probability of case log probability of probability of case log probability of case. But this is really the basis for how we think about how to transfer information across communication channels, how to encode information into strings of character. And leave it at that and not that. Let me go back to this quote again. Whenever one uses the word entropy in a discussion, one always wins, since no one knows what entropy actually is. So I hope I've given you a little flavor for why entropy is, in a sense, obvious and, in a sense, also very complicated. It's obvious because we can think of entropy as automatically direction when things move. The more disordered things are, the more entropy they have. And life inexorably moves from an order to more disordered situation. That's the, ob that's the obvious context in which we think about the entropy, the heat death of the universe, the arrow of time. But the more complicated part of entropy and the reasons for this confusion, the way you're able to use it in whichever way you want, is all of these different contexts in which it arises. We talked about the context in which you have reversible events, which became irreversible when you translate it as two particles colliding right up into, into, into an egg collapsing. We gave an example for where this happens in the dogs and when you think about that argument. How you can start with an asymmetric condition initially and wind up with some symmetric condition, even though the rules for hopping the flight didn't really matter. That's why that is important. So disorder increases at the expense of order. That's the fundamental bottom line that we have when we think about it. Then we move completely somewhere else and we talk about the efficiency of team engine. And we said entropy appears in another way then. Entropy appears in this remarkable observation that heat always flows spontaneously from all the force and never the other way around. And this sets certain limits on physical processes. When heat flows from hot to cold, it carries with it. Any flow of heat carries with it entropy. In order to restore a system to its old state, you have to suck the entropy out of it. So the constraint on an engine that functions with heat at two different temperatures is that you must be whatever entropy you put in, you must be able to pull out. But pulling out entropy always comes to the cost. It's never free. And that's really what sets the limits on how engine comes. Finally, what information is there in an observation? That's the idea of Shannon. That if you, and Shannon applies this to many contexts, but one context is that of language. If you think about it, the English language or Kannada or Tamil or Malayalam, etc., it's just a set of characters. And in some of those characters appear with more probability than others. The letter E, for example, appears with a high probability. And the letter Z, I don't know too many words to start with, Z is much more uncommon. So I can have a probability of finding some characters in, for example, let's take the text of some book like Hamlet or the Fifth or the Bible or something like that. And break it up and we'll say how many times does E appear, how many times does A appear, C, 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 C. And then try to make words out of that, given that. So if I, I say, okay, let me choose my first letter, E is high property, let me choose that to be an E, choose another thing with some other property, can I make text out of that? And the answer is that English language and any language doesn't quite work like that. For example, if I chose a letter Q, which happens with relatively low probability, after Q, the letter that most often comes is a U. Queen, Quest, Quagmire, etc. Et so it's not just enough to know just about the probabilities of finding these letters, but how letters, maybe even three letters in a row come together. And then you can ask about, okay, let me forget, let me just look at the probability of words. The English word and, the English word the appears much more often in, in the text than any other publication of their So Shannon was in this very nice paper that Shannon wrote, he was able to show that you could reproduce many of the characteristics of English text just by knowing the probabilities that this word appeared in relation to each other. And you could actually get a computer to turn out a manuscript it almost looked as though it had been written by a real person. And the way to think about this at a very fundamental level is to ask what is the entropy that we associate with a certain text, with the race that with the properties that these words and letters together appear with each other. And that's a deep way of thinking about how we communicate. So let me finish up with that.